Yo, what's up, y'all? Right, another Tuesday, another live coding stream. Let's do this. Um, I think last time, I don't really remember where we left off, but um, really what we're trying to do today, as the stream title says, is we're gonna try and do some authentication, just um, to make sure that, you know, no one can hack into our code or hack into our application. Um, the way that it's going to work uh, is an anonymous user will visit our website. They'll click a register button. Then they will be redirected to federated login, something like uh, Google or whatever. The provider will then redirect us back towards our site with a valid JOT token. And then we need to check whether we already know a registered player with that uh, sub. Just so um, when, when they're already registered with us, then we can link them to an actual player. <clears throat> if um, that's not the case, then we will present them with a form with like the actual registration uh, link, let's say. Um, or like where they just need to uh, input their username. Then when one once that has happened, then we finally can link that uh, player to its um, the identity provider's number, basically the identification number, and then the sub, which is like the identification with that provider for this logged in person. And then we finally have a player registered event. Um, that's it. And then when they are known already, so on second login, they just get redirected to their own home page and uh, none of this needs to happen. So it's most of this stuff is front end um, here where we already know um, who the player is. <clears throat> we can, um, yeah, this is re redirect logic, basically, all of this stuff. So there's, there's going to be a bunch of Elm today, I think, and then some setup. So the way that I wanted to do this is I wanted to set up my own um, key cloak, which is an IDP, so that I can say, like, look, go towards this um, identity provider and try to log in there. Um, then we can, you know, determine what was Gucci basically. We could also actually use Auth0 for this uh, or Okta or whatever. Um, and it might be a lot easier. Hmm. It might be more difficult to test though, locally or via integration way. Hmm. I don't want a dependency on, uh, on my IDP is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> when I'm running my tests. But first, let's cheers. Today we are drinking um, Krijke Wit, uh, Krijke Silver, sorry. It's a lovely beer. It's got a bunch of citrus hints and I, I love that, like when it tastes a bit cit citrusy. So cheers. Mm. Bitter and citrusy, love it. Uh, yeah, um, let's let's just try and do key cloak, uh, key cloak, docker hub or something. I don't know. <clears throat> they should give us a docker container that is going to run key cloak. Um, and what we can do then is we can add that docker file to our ops folder 
over here where we all had a, already have Postgres. So maybe we can just copy that already and call it key cloak. So this is going to be our security provider or the place where we will redirect our users towards or anonymous people towards so that they can log in. Well, let's check it out, shall we? Um, so, oh, I don't know, services. I, mm, I do vaguely remember that they require a database as well. So let's try and <clears throat> set up a Postgres for that. So, so this would be Keycloak's, key, Keycloak DB or something, I don't know. Um, and then this part, so the other service, <laughs> excuse me. Okay, it does appear that, that these need to be indented or not. Damn, these fucking spaces, I hate it so much. See, why is this complaining now already? Incompatible types. Oh, um... Something is off here, I think. I think, yeah, ports and image and environment. Voila, that looks better. So this is the database. Um, <clears throat> and then this is going to be the actual key cloak uh, server or something. Just call it IDP maybe. That'll be easier. And then the image name, I don't know. Um, JBoss Key Cloak. Maybe it's even better to just use the latest or something. Where do we have tags? Here we go. <clears throat> uh, so we are at 12.04. Let's, let's use this one. Voila. And then let's check which settings we'll need to take over. So um, we've got an 8080 port. So that we definitely need to remap because I think our uh, main application is running there. So let's call it uh, 7070 or something. I don't know. <clears throat> And then what? Oh yeah, there is no admin user, so okay. So we'll need two environment properties here. You can also create an account on an already running container. Yeah, that's not what I wanted, I guess. Oh, maybe I should make it a little bit larger then you can also read along. <coughs> Uh, DB vendor is going to be Postgres then. Okay, um, so we've got key cloak user. Let's do. Uh, we already have Mamra. Let's do Berus. And then their password will be I heart bats. And then for other stuff, DP vendor should be Postgres. If it's not specified, it'll try to detect the DB vendor based on 
Is the default host name for the DB set using get? No, I don't think that will be the case. Ah, okay, so we can. Oh, this is deprecated. Never mind. So we'll set DB vendor to just Postgres. <clears throat> and then we'll need this, I guess. So that would be. Uh, key cloak db so referring to this one. Oh, we need to uh, definitely change this thing so that would be i don't know 7 6 5 4 i guess and then we'll call it something else so this is the uh, key cloak db i don't care for the username and password So that will be snarf Voila Sure The schema, do we want to do that? I think this is fine as well. The port. Mm. The port, I think we need to define as well. Or was that the default one? Optional. Maybe this, this will work. I think this should be okay. And then what? <clears throat> so we will be using docker compose to run this so we don't need to set up our network explicitly because we'll have it implicitly be if we just run it using docker compose and then what uh, here they do define the postgres database though so maybe we should do that as well like so okay maybe this is already good enough let's see what that thing does uh, so I'll docker compose dash f in ops key cloak and then just specify up oh, oh wait i do need to say it's this thing here i believe oof It's a different project there. So we are pulling the latest, but we've specified the tag. So at least this part is going to work. <laughs> would have been weird if it didn't. Um, and then the next step would be if we've got that stuff up and running. I vaguely remember that there was, oh, maybe I didn't plug it in here. So there's an Elm OIDC. Um, hmm. I 
authenticate Alum with OpenID Connect on an Auth0. <laughs> That's a bit too bad <laughs> that we are not using Auth0 for this. <clears throat> okay, cool. Seems to be running fine there. Oh, that's evil. Baited me into going to Alt Zero. Maybe here we will find answers. Looking for links. Oh, quite recent. Let's check it out. All right. Let's do implicit. Okay, this looks great. It even has demos. So I think we can already go ahead and do an element stall on that. As my, uh, oh, right, this seems to be loading. So the database is loaded and now, no wait, it's the other way around. <clears throat> No, the database is done. Now it's starting up the IDP where it does say that you're using Postgres SQL as a database. Oh, it stopped. Is it trying to read? Uh, it's starting again. The hell? The batch executed su successfully. It looks like it's up and running, but I'm not sure if it, it keeps on shutting down and starting up again. Hope, well, hopefully this is just initially like this. Otherwise, I have no idea what's going on. Fail to clean existing content. Bruh. Okay, I guess we'll get back to this. Oh wait, now it's doing something more. Started server. Well. All right, and now it's doing its um, clustering thing. So if you run Keycloak in multiple containers, it's going to start Oh, yikes. This looks like a bunch of failures. Oh, okay, and here we've got exited. No real error message, though. <clears throat> oh, man, I vaguely remember this thing. Maybe what we could do is, yeah, I really don't know actually what we could do to figure out what's wrong. It's just guessing now. Ah, um, we could try specifying the port. So that was this thing and then maybe we need to specify, oh. hmm. okay, specify this one then. I'm not sure if you need to refer to this port because I think it should be this one. Um. Oh, 
let's just do that again and then in the meanwhile I can install some stuff duh let's go <clears throat> Cool. I wonder if you're going to get the same error message now as before. But I hope not, of course. Or, well, actually, I do hope we get the same error message because otherwise, just restarting it is going to fix our problem. <laughs> and then we don't know why. Why? Also, in the meanwhile, we could check some more docs here on uh, Geekloak's Docker site. Wait. Uh, this is why uh, it's not going to work. It's called Geekloak DB, and I should have called it key, just Geekloak. That's probably why. Okay, let's just kill it and retry. Maybe this is why it's restarting because um, if you pass along the username and password then it will automatically restart after, after having applied this uh, call basically. Um, we were also checking. Vault. That's, oh yeah, that SSL stuff. Oh boy. That I don't really care about. Okay, um, let's check out the examples. Let's just do Oath Zero or something. <clears throat> This is really cool. All right, source code, let's go. And quite recent, five months ago, let's start this. Oh, but it's at 69. Do I want to be that person? Okay, this is, it looks like quite the same as before. And then it broke. Looks like it's breaking again. Oh, hello. <laughs> Carbera tutorials. Welcome. Thank you for the, the raid. What's up? 
We are just checking out some stuff. I'm trying to do, uh, <laughs> trying to do a bit of an OIDC implementation. I'm running into some issues by running my own uh, key cloak in a Docker container. Uh, but the UI seems to be promising. Oh, hello, friend. Hey. Uh, yeah. So if y'all have any idea <laughs> how to fix this or how to, uh, I don't know, uh, read this in fact well what should doing maybe I shall start at the very beginning maybe <clears throat> ah nice spending two hours doing something that doesn't work <laughs> I feel you <laughs> that sounds very it really hits home, <laughs> home let's say. <laughs> Thank you for the raid. So what we're building is um, basically a, a leaderboard website for some uh, video game online called Diabotical. It really doesn't matter all that much. But uh, the way it looks like... Uh, oh man, this is going really slow. Um... So we've got a UI and a backend. Wait, this, this is the wrong picture. We should be looking at this one. So it's just one single deployable that contains both a backend and Kotlin and Spring Boot. And uh, our UI wheel, we're building in Elm, a functional programming language. We've got some event sourcing going on and uh, we're projecting stuff into a, re a relational database. And right now we're trying to secure all of this um, using OIDC implicit flow if that makes any sense to you <laughs> um, we're using clean architecture i like using we're trying to do clean architecture like the proper way it's quite difficult and this is our dependency diagram showing that a bit but maybe the thing that will make the most sense is uh, this part here <clears throat> where we've got some players that are new and once they're they register, they, uh, then a player registered event is fired. A leaderboard event listener uh, listens to that event, picks it up, puts it in the event stream, and then a timer goes off to rehydrate. It's called a leaderboard. Yeah, it is pretty complicated, but it's uh, <laughs> especially for a hobby project, I don't recommend doing this, but it's for uh, mostly learning, and I want to feel more confident in uh, with these kinds of architectures so yeah that's what i've been trying to do and i've even have like this nice story map here um and uh, like a little, small little kanban board where we've done all of this before um we've got the, the, the walking skeleton walking now actually and we're really doing this one but to do that, we need some way of authentication. Well, the languages that we're using are both Kotlin and uh, Elm. Maybe I can show Elm first, which is probably going to be the most mind boggling thing. Um, so Elm is a pure functional language. Um, you basically declare all of your stuff. <clears throat> I also really love Kotlin. <laughs> I, I really, really love it. But more on that later. I also really love Elm. OID, uh, the, the service is OIDC. Yeah. It's a Open ID Connect. That's what OIDC stands for. And it's part of the OAuth2 specification. But nobody cares about that stuff. <laughs> uh, this is all there is to Elm, basically. It's um, an application consisting of a bunch of functions. Uh, one is a view function. 
uh, an update function and uh, some subscriptions, but like uh, the model is mo more important to that, in fact. Um, <clears throat> and the beginning part is really just showing um, which pages we are going to be rendering. And um, yeah. So this looks complicated, but then maybe if we go to a registration scenario, which is going to be in Kotlin as well. So in, in Kotlin is that there's a nice feature. You can have spaces in your function names or your method names if you use backticks. And what we're doing here is we're setting up an anonymous user, uh, which then registers themselves. Then on successful registration, we get our player ID. Then we are going to verify this one, that the nickname is indeed equal to the one that was posted here. Then we are going to fetch all of the registered players and can verify that there's only a single person in there, which is me. And we also do some checks on the event stream and uh, verify that the leaderboard was created with no rank and a score of zero. I'm gonna need to catch up with chat a bit. Hang on. Eh? It's the case a lot where I make something and then I go, I would not recommend this. <laughs> but those are like very good uh, lessons learned then I get. And you know why you don't want to recommend it as well. Uh, that's the YDC part. You hate phone keyboard. All right, I understand. Which part are you stuck on? I've never used to. Can't guarantee I'll be able to help, but I can try at least. Good night, Cider. Thanks for passing by. Um, the part that I'm stuck on right now is I wanted to make sure that I've got a local uh, identity provider set up so that I can eventually also run my tests against that one so that I don't have a dependency on like an outside identity provider like Google or Facebook or whatever. But I might need to find a different solution for that anyway. So I think to unblock myself, I can just decide right now to just start using Google, for example, or um, anything else really like OAuth. And then just do the front end security, like just securing my front end would be also be great. But after that, I'll need to uh, Secure my REST API as well, of course. Uh, do I have a a nice diagram for that as well? I guess I don't. No, I don't. I don't have a, a component diagram. That's too bad. Oh yeah. Yeah, so that I, I, I understand, but it's really key cloak. Getting, getting key cloak to run is the part that I'm stuck on. It's not really stuck, I guess. So if you know how to interpret this stuff, why is my executor being shut down? Uh, I could try running my database separately from uh, Keycloak itself, but then, yeah, whatever. Oh yeah, something I haven't tried yet is this. Maybe we can just try that and see what's going on there. And in the meanwhile, we can just try and tr try to understand how to use the uh, Elm OAuth 2 package to try and uh, yeah implement OIDC in our Elm app. So here they've got an example, <clears throat> which is already a bit weird, where they convert bytes into an init function. <laughs> Don't know about that. Ah, and it's just to get random bytes. Cool. This is a bit different. Um, that's cool because I would love that. And then what? Here they've got some configuration, which I bet is part of the, the, this, this, Elm OAuth 2 module or package, I think it's called. So the, the way I know that it works is first you get directed towards a public site. Then when you want to access a private 
part of the site, you should get redirected towards uh, authentication or author authorization. Sorry. <clears throat> uh, okay. So here it is idle redirect, then you're authorized and then you get redirected back from um, the IDP, the identity provider. And that endpoint should be in charge of, um, you know, like setting the session that there is a user now that is authenticated on your website. Mm, so what they seem to be doing here is they are going to make it really explicit which kind of state your app is in. So either you're idle or I guess unauthorized should also work. Uh, or you could be authorized and you have a token in that case. Done could be, I don't really know what that is. I guess if you receive your token, then you can go fetch the user information or something bad happened and you want to do something with the error. And that's this stuff. Cool. Here's the configuration that they've set up before. Where was that? Over here. Hmm. Was it the same kind of? I ah, know this is just uh, the model configuration. It's a bit uh, weird, huh? And then what? Yeah, so I am indeed using a, a specific library for the OIDC stuff. It's the Elm OAuth 2 uh, library. I'm gonna link that right here. <clears throat> and this one, yeah, yeah I hope should be helpful. I think it already looks quite nice and it's been recently updated even so, yeah. Sounds promising. We do have um, um, a port here. That's something I haven't used yet. So ports are Elm's way to interact with the JavaScript part in your HTML page. So um, it's going to be maybe a bit difficult to uh, to understand that part. <clears throat> so we expect there to be a gen random bytes and a random bytes uh, function in our um, JavaScript function, I mean, in our HTML somewhere. So that's why this is uh, listed like that. So somewhere in the HTML, this is gonna be there, but then I guess I also expect this thing to be there. Okay. Anywho, what do they do in the update function? Here they're going to, ah, this is already really cool because <clears throat> They're checking only the flow part of uh, the model. So that would be also really nice for us. Since we need to do some routing based on whether or not you're logged in. Maybe I should make that a bit more explicit. Where was that? Oh wait, this is... Oh, it's still dead. It's too bad. Um, somewhere here. Yeah. Authentication flow. Ah. I guess I'd rather express this in uh, actual pages now because uh, now you don't really see which page you're on. Um, <clears throat> but we can for show. Copy paste that somewhere. So, if an anonymous user visits the website, maybe I can, it's already running though, so maybe I can run. Run the backend, where is it at? Here, scrambled application, let's run it. Yeah, there is UI. I was just about to show it <laughs> and make it a bit more interesting for y'all. Uh, but I have to spin up my backend for that. And I'm not sure if the 
correct docker containers are up and running for that. Up and up. So these are both uh, for my project indeed. So they are up and running. And now we have to wait, I guess, for the backend to start up. And then in the meanwhile, I can sort of figure out what to show. We've got two pages now um, that I can show. We've got one called home and then the other one called registration. Ah, uh, maybe I can already show it here actually. So this is what the anonymous home page looks like. So. If you're not logged in, you're greeted with uh, th just the leaderboard, who is uh, where and which rank. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Yeah, no worry. It's a, it's a very uh, complex part, in fact. People always act as if it's really uh, simple or like easy to do but it's definitely not I think it's really really complex there because there's a bunch of routing that needs to happen correctly you really need to think about which pages are supposed to be protected and which ones are not um, you know and then deal with the routing and all that jazz okay why is it not it's not doing anything Mm. Oh, there we go. See, once you click on that X button, sort of putting the whip to uh, Spring Boot. Oh, okay, starting. Okay, it looks like it's up and running. My UI is also up and running, so it should. I should be able to access it somewhere. Where did I? Uh, there isn't any local hosting running yet. Ah, oh, maybe here. Nope. Uh, so local host, local host. 80, no, 3000. Yeah. Oh, no, it was. Now I don't remember. Let's check it out. If I re just restart this one then it's going to automatically open a browser for me so we're also using elm live oh it was no wait it was 8000 okay here we go Ta-da! glorious looking web page where um there is one person registered in the ranking which is me <laughs> and th this is just dummy data and this should look like this a bit <laughs> Of course, it really doesn't really, but we can do navigation now. So if you're anonymous and you want to register, you can click on this thing here and then uh, join. We'll do this and join the fry. Uh -huh. And then it stays on loading or whatever. I don't know if that's supposed to be the case. Oh, it's actually lagging so much. Oh, bad request. That's interesting and new. Oh, right. Okay, uh, I, I know why uh, this is. So last time what we did, <laughs> if you ever get registered, you are going to be on the leaderboard. <laughs> um, so last time, we messed around with a registration controller and we um, passed along, um, is it this one? This should have a post mapping, there we go, of a register player. So the info that is required to, to register somebody. And here we uh, need both the nickname and the jot.iss and jot.sub stuff. So for that, we don't we, we don't pass this along yet in our UI. So maybe <laughs> Hey newbie corn, what's up? 
the Kotlin guy. <laughs> cool. What's up? Uh, yeah. That's right. Kotlin is boggers. Um, and I was just showing that we're getting a 400 bad request because our UI is not adding the jot ISS or sub <clears throat> and that's why Jackson can't parse this stuff. So maybe what I should do instead for now is just make this optional. Um, and then, because I'm not sure, I think this still needs an, an actual one, so it should not compile now. I'm making a Kotlin, well, I'm making a website um, using Kotlin as a in the back end, but then Elm in the front end. Thanks for following, by the way. So maybe here we can just say uh, some ISS or something, I don't really know. And here we'll just map that as well to uh, one, two, three, I don't know. Well, actually, this is not Kator, but I do have uh, a Kator implementation as well. And I was like, as a side project on my side project, which is this one, <laughs> I was trying to use Kator instead of um, Spring Boot. So for those unawares, we've got uh, the, the more, oh damn, what's that idiomatic Kotlin way? Of working, yeah, and the, the more idiomatic way of working is to use a Kator because it's more descriptive, I would say. Um, but yeah, so this REST API module is all Spring Boot, and then the Kator API is all Kator, but I, I'm not uh, there yet. Oh, I'm also looking for more advanced stuff in Kotlin, but I'm not sure what you really mean by advanced. Um, but I do have a bunch of stuff on my YouTube. I wonder if I configured Nightbot. Oh, I did not. That's too bad. <laughs> uh, but hang on, eh? I will just link it and then... Uh... Yeah, really, it's just uh, YouTube uh, HTTP. Hang on. Oh, my PC is so slow, or my, my Mac. <laughs> Ever since I started using this new, uh, what's it called, uh, layout, it's been a bit slow. So maybe I need to drop the, the nice animated background. Uh. Why don't I use material theme in the Elm UI maybe? Um, that's a good question. I don't really know. I think it might be material, in fact, but um, the default settings or um, what's it called? Style? No, that's not it. Um, hang on. Eh? I think in Elm.json, <coughs> we're using Elm UI, Elm UI widgets, and the Elm UI widgets do use material UI. Uh, can I show that somewhere? I think it's in base somewhere, probably. Yeah, all of this stuff should be uh, supposedly material, but yeah, I don't really know. Oh, you mean material theme for IntelliJ, maybe? That I, I don't, yeah. I don't really care that much about it, but I'll check it out afterwards. Yeah. Um, I'll check it out afterwards for sure. So, okay, so now we've fixed 
quote unquote, we've uh, <laughs> hacked our way into allowing registration and then Carbera can maybe finally become one of the people on the registered, on, on the ranking. Oh my God, it's really super slow. I was wondering, do you know if um, if I if I were to use a streaming card like what's that called, like an Elgato or whatever, does it offload the processing power that Streamlabs takes or like the OBS? Because that's the part that hurts the most, I think. If I run this regularly, I have no no issue with this with it whatsoever. But look at how, how slow it's reacting. It's this is insane. <laughs> Here, look, now it's reacting. I've <laughs> amazing. Carbera, what were you doing actually? What what uh, language do you code in? Or live code in, I should say. Right, here we go. Eh? So we just go back to the, the main page again, where just me is there. I'm going to register. I'm gonna go, ah, Carbera tutorials. We'll do join the fry. Oh, you are now registered. Oh, what's up with that? So if we go back to the main page, you're still not in the leaderboard. And the reason for that is because um, the player registered event has been broadcast, but it hasn't been processed yet by the leaderboard stuff yet. Ah, Python. Cool. The overlay would still be done through OBS. Yeah, it would still lag out. I think so too. Offloading the recording processing might fix it. Ah, yeah, that's a good good point. Okay, I'll try try to check that stuff out But so you are registered now we just have to wait <laughs> until the next time um, The policy gets triggered oh wait, I think we fixed that last time hang on eh? um, Oh No, where did I put that? Somewhere in the registration scenario. Because I remember, ah, here we go. Trigger leaderboard rehydration. So if we just execute this thing in an HTTP request. No, wait, a new HTTP, yep. And we I'm typing, I swear. And we go to slash API leaderboard slash rehydrate. This should um, execute the leaderboard rehydration. Oh, I was doing a get, that's not smart. I think it was a post, I don't remember. Oh. Broadcast it. Regenerate triggered with two players. Here we go. And now we just refresh. And you're in the leaderboard, my friend. <laughs> cool, eh? Thanks for following, by the way. Hey! It's nice, eh? Yeah, so th that was like a very, very annoying problem, actually. Because... I wrote this this scenario test <clears throat> that then also checked uh, like in an asynchronous way did the leaderboard rehydrate and only then I can verify of course if I'm in there already so uh, this is it this is why and before it was like every X amount of minutes, but then I was like, you know what? <laughs> Let's just um, create an endpoint where you can trigger it manually. And in that case, 
uh, you can just do it whenever you want and then you can make sure that your leaderboard is correct for your scenarios and now it it actually came in handy to um, get you in the leaderboard as well cool eh? all right so this is like something I, I really need to fix somehow it can't really be um, how do you say this like very incomplete code Corgi, Corgi, the what the hurl? Okay, let me write that down somewhere. I wonder what it is. That's ah, a game engine, ah, cool. The the only game I ever wrote was. Um, or like even like a very 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 small part of the game it was called the game called Mo Moo Base Commander, which was a, a ripoff of a Moon Base Commander, which we tried to do in Elm as well. It must be running. Actually, it might still be running live somewhere. Uh, <laughs> it brings me back. something like this might be this I'm not really sure ah dang it uh, I vaguely 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 remember how this works so here there should be move move base command Maybe it's on my own repository then. It would be sad a bit. Uh, repositories. And as you can see, I need to update my picture. <laughs> I don't look like that at all anymore. Oh, here it is. Moobase Commander. It might still be up. It's still up. LOL. So you can aim right. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> oh my god. And add some force and then launch. Hey. And then so the idea of moon base commander was uh, something like. <laughs> Here you go. Then you can click on this one and from that position you can. Uh, Start, oops, start again and then launch. And then the idea is uh, eventually, like one of these stations, um, they all need to be connected. So if I were to destroy this one, then um, both this one and this one would be destroyed because there's no link to that thing anymore. The game is actually really, really cool. Like the, the actual game, I mean. <laughs> this one, not so much. <laughs> oh yeah. If you like uh, execution time, you should look at Goa. Or Rust, actually. Rust is crazy. I can't believe I managed to find this game again. Oh my god. Yeah, the actual game is much, much cooler. <laughs> like, much cooler. Let's click on this thing. You nice people deserve to watch this. Oh boy. Let's mute it. Look at this beautiful, beautiful looking bases. Look at this. This is so cool. And the idea is that you Go and fetch resources here by 
launching another pod here, like the energy thing. Next gen graphics, yeah, it's quite old, but it's a really nice, nice looking game. I mean, uh, it plays great. So here they're aiming. That, that's what we were doing here before as well. And then this bar will show you how much power you need to, uh, well, not need, but at what power you're going to shoot out a new base. Look at that. And now they've got new energy here and with that energy they can do uh, new stuff like fire rockets or whatever. I'm not sure if they're gonna do that. Oh, and there's some stuff that was damaged there. That's repairing. Here's defense. So if somebody else shoots stuff, hey. <laughs> Honestly, this game is amazing. But so that's the thing that we were trying to build in uh, uh, in Elm. I think it, it might be on... Oh, I remember we tried installing it and I think it might have been on Steam, but I don't remember. I don't remember. I had such good times with that game back in the days. <laughs> but yeah. In the meanwhile, we were actually trying to... Wait, so that's the UI. That's it. That's it, basically. So when you arrive at this page, should be fine. You don't need to register yet. <clears throat> then, however, when you want to register, you click this button. And I think I want people to be redirected here now. Or maybe... Hmm. Yeah, I want them to be redirected already to like Google or whatever, like an IDP. Then use their Google credentials to log in. And when they come back, then they still need to fill in their nickname and then they will be able to click on this button. And at that point, we will be able to uh, link both the ISS sub and then their nickname to create a registered player. That's it basically. And then um, what happens if you've already logged in? We don't actually have a feature for that yet. I guess the register button shouldn't be there if you're already logged in. So maybe that can be like a, a good way of verifying that you've already logged in. Maybe there should be a logout button somewhere. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Google does have uh, their own API for login stuff do I have an empty line on top here or on top of what ah okay yeah so uh, this is dummy data it's uh, so no matches have been played actually <laughs> we're really just only at uh, registering players and then uh, we've got a leaderboard that's created based on the amount of challenges that they've done. Yeah, yeah, this stuff is just hard-coded. Maybe I, I really shouldn't actually just put it there. It's very confusing. You're not the first one that, <laughs> that asked that question. Uh, so OpenID is, is really just a way to... Um, uh, how do you say? It's a specification to get somebody to visit your website as an authenticated person, an authenticated user. So you, there's just, it's nothing more than a protocol of like stuff going back and forth between uh, different applications really. And one of the applications is uh, is us, the the web the web application here, and then the other application is Google, and they are providing the authentication part. So they're basically the the identity provider. So they 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 look at you, and they say like, who are you? Oh, you're Tim. Okay, nice. What's your password? Oh, this. Okay, nice. We've checked our logs, and uh, we we can guarantee that you are indeed Tim. 
here we go and then uh, yeah, me basically but just my browser will redirect back towards um, my ui and then my ui will be able to detect ah look i've got this jot token here now i know that tim is indeed authenticated and i can do stuff with that and trust that stuff where did you learn kotlin um god that's a good question my first encounter with it was when somebody at uh, a code retreat in belgium introduced it to me and they were like hey i want to try this code retreat in uh, kotlin do th this exercise and i can teach you some stuff so that was already nice didn't touch it after a long time and then i learned again about the nullability like the explicit null stuff and i was like man this is really really interesting again so then i started learning it again myself and i ended up at the coursera kotlin for java developers course and it's a really really good one <clears throat> This uh, is a really good course. Uh, it's free. And if you're done doing this, I think then you can do the Kotlin go ons. Yeah, I mean, it's called for Java developers, but really it's just a bunch of exercises. I don't even think that they touch a bunch of Java stuff in any case. So, uh, And then the go ons are also really nice yeah here you can play with koans online yeah It basically allows the website to see authenticated users as different entities. I think so, yeah. Hey, you're welcome. This is really, really nice stuff. Um, I think <clears throat> the, the one thing that's quite cool, I thought, is um, there is one playlist that i have so i've been doing this for a while by by the way here this is a really uh if you want advanced features the here i'm building uh, a board game in kotlin using event sourcing a bit but it's really like simple stuff um but i show off a bunch of fancy stuff like um extension functions maybe that i can already show as well i'm gonna really like that where you can be like extremely expressive by using extension functions and keeping them private um maybe it's here um I think it's here in fact I'm not really sure let's see yeah all right so this is like the main function you need to look at and um, here what we're doing is we're receiving a command to register a player we're first fetching to see if it's already if they are already registered or not then we just create a registered player and we dot save it so of course the dot save it doesn't really exist on registered player because it's a it's an entity it's a domain object um but so why is it that you can still call this well because i have a private extension function that uses the collaborator player repository and it's a collaborator of the registered player handler so you can um, basically inject any stuff you want but then still make it look nice and concise i think maybe an even better example would be in the leaderboard policy nope in the policy oops leaderboard policy 
Ale. Maybe it's most challenges. Yeah, this this thing. This thing. Look, look, look. Alright, here we go. We rehydrate our leaderboard, then we project it, basically getting a different uh, type, a list of projected players, and then we regenerate them, <laughs> even if it's, a, if it's a list. And the regenerate does the does a wipe and then a store of uh, this list. It's nice, huh? So you do have to train your eye a bit though on just looking at what's important here. But once you do that, then everything becomes very, very clear. Excuse me. Very clear indeed. But yeah, that uh, that last playlist about uh, Magnum Sol and maybe the corresponding GitHub repository, that's, that might help you along a bit a bit more. I think you, it's the, the GitHub repository itself is also the sort of setup for a kata. <laughs> I'm sorry. Don't don't be um, how do you say? Don't don't be disappointed or don't be uh, dejected. I, d I also didn't learn this like in two hours. <laughs> it's been a while. And it'll provide an iteration interface for you. Extend any data class and it'll provide an iteration interface. I'm not sure if that's true. Or I haven't uh, used it yet. I know that you can... Uh, if you say that something is an iterable or... Um, uh, ah, yeah, maybe this is like a, a, another cool part here. <laughs> Dot generate a custom function. This, uh, yeah, this one is indeed an extension function on a, a list of projected players. So if I were to do call this a list of strings, then this wouldn't compile any longer. See? So I'm um, declaring this function after the facts, basically, on a type that I normally don't have control uh, over. It's a bit funky, but it makes you, it, it makes it look a bit nicer. Otherwise, <clears throat> I would add this, it's, it's the same way really as uh, having this, um, as like a thing. And then you would do, uh, you would call regenerate using this list. And then it would look exactly the same as here basically, but then it would, would take a list of projected players as an argument. It's really the same, but it's just written a bit nicer and more concise. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. You can use functions before defining them as well. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit um, ambiguous what you mean when you say use functions. You can for sure write it because here the order uh, is after. Uh, I declare regenerate after I quote unquote use it. Uh, so if you just read it, but uh, it still needs to be there because it gets compiled to some kind of class so that th this does indeed uh, work at runtime, of course. The, the one thing I still want to discover in Kotlin is the, the multi-platform stuff. So I want to learn a bit more on um, can you use Kotlin for everything, also 
for writing UIs, for example. I mean, web pages, basically, <laughs> not just UIs, because I know it's used in, uh, in Android. It's broken? Oh, that's sad. Broken, wait, broken how? Like, broken in a good way? Like, it's overpowered, or...? That could also be a... Kotlin JS or Kotlin React. Ah, cool. Oh, I see. <clears throat> you can mess up pretty badly. That's that's not the Kotlin way. <laughs> Kotlin is about making stuff that doesn't break. And Elm is even further down that road. <laughs> so, which is why I love it so much. Yeah. So you, you you did already have experience with that. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, I still want to experiment a bit with it anyway. All right. Cheers, Carvera. Thanks again for raiding and uh, have a nice uh, meal. <laughs> I would say I have no idea what time zone you're in. It could be dinner, it could be breakfast. Their new UI thing. Oh, uh, this vaguely rings a bell. Hashtag their new UI thing. I think I have seen it. The name escapes me. Compose, that's it, yeah. I saw some stuff on their YouTube channel about it, but it's for, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Compose is amazing. Okay, cool. I'll go check it out. I'll also write that down. Compose. There we go. Kinda annoying. <laughs> okay. Ah, okay. It's for making desktop clients. I see. Yeah, the thing is, the stuff I'm doing now. If you if you think hard about it or hard enough about it, it would still be applicable to my day job. I mean, I could start using Kotlin. At work any day now if somebody's watching please let me do some cotton um but yeah fat clients we rarely we rarely do yeah ah it's just not stable yet okay yeah okay looking forward to when it is in fact yeah Need to do more stuff. Uh, you also become a streamer, Nubicorn. Then you've got an excuse to uh, do Kotlin. That's also my approach. Just learn while streaming. People will, will come on your stream and help you. <laughs> or at least that's my ex or that's been my experience. Me too, yeah, me too. Alright. Uh, this part. I I don't really want to copy paste this stuff. Um, because, I mean, it's not going to work completely in our application. But it might work for a bit. Ha, it's kind of difficult to choose what to copy paste now though. Uh, games. Do you hope to, uh, or do you plan on becoming a game developer, Nubicorn? It's really cool. Hmm, let me see if they also have <coughs> their HTML somewhere. Oh, I'm afraid I don't. Or, or maybe in here? Nope. You do and don't at the same time. 
the do is because it's interesting to build games and the don't is because it's such a niche uh, employer that it's going to be difficult to find work at or uh, what's your what's your worry not that I know anything about that <laughs> Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, I see. Making menus, sexy, sexy menus. That's always nice. Huh? Oh yeah, we were here in fact in the example stuff. Aha, look, look it. This is the stuff that we also are going to need. <clears throat> Hmm. Oof. I don't know why they would do this. Ah, that's maybe. Oof. This is already quite. Um. Quite extensive uh, security, I, I guess, because they randomize some token that they that they match to your browser upon revisiting it or something like that. Oof. That's quite, quite complex. But you know what? Let's jam it in there anyway. Here's the script. Uh, voila. <clears throat> Flags starting state. Maybe I shouldn't call it bytes though, and that would be a bit weird. Will you ever make a Kotlin tutorial thing? Yeah, sure. What what do you expect from um, a Kotlin tutorial thing? It seems like a great idea. Let's do text. Oh, I should have done markdown, in fact. Kotlin tutorial thing. What do you expect? Basics. Basic syntax. I don't know. Oh yeah. How to install the... Uh, Oh, okay, I see. Like a more up to websites, databases, UIs. Dot, dot, dot. And uh, what's the, like, why not just follow a course? Follow a course. Hmm, why would I rather watch a Twitch streamer or maybe a YouTube channel more easily accessible? And you cannot add, oh, this is a very good one. That's very true. Yeah. But the the course for um, the the Kotlin for Java devs is very very broad. But maybe yeah, I'll have to look at it again. The other cool thing I think about that course is um, it sort of forces you to first make exercises that you can use and solve within your browser. Um, which you need to fill in then, and only then you can continue with the next uh, chapters, let's say. So it sort of checks, the previous checks, or the next chapters will check whether or not you've understood the previous one, so that's really nice. Yeah. 
cost money. So basically what you're saying is if I make a good course, I can charge money for it. Kidding, of course, kidding. Basic syntax, maybe like I want to do uh, some cool stuff like show extension functions. Uh, the maybe as a first thing, this nullable types. And then <clears throat> oh no, maybe first um, nice list or iterable functions like mop, etc. You can't really always skip stuff you already know or don't care about. This is also very true. So maybe I should also make them uh, always skip through stuff you already know about. So make short and sweet tutorial bits. That's it, I guess. Yeah, nice. Okay. This sounds like a, a project though. So I think I'll need to think about when when to do this or maybe like as an in-between thing, like an in-between mm, mm, this thing that I'm trying to finish as well. Like finish, go further in learning for uh, personal gain, let's say, my knowledge, I mean. Yeah. But yeah, thanks for the suggestion. I think it's cool. Cool. I'll go uh I'll check when I when I have time to build this. I think it's it's quite quite okay, eh? the time that you've in, that I invest in this. It should be okay. Non Android, ah, that's why as well. Yeah. Not many non Android Kotlin tutorials. That's I've also found on uh, on YouTube. Like I was looking for this kind of content myself, and I didn't find it. That's true. All right. Okay, so uh, this I will keep in I don't know where do I keep that um voila Pretty much any Kotlin related thing you see somehow leads to Android stuff, yeah. Yes. Me too. Ah, wait, you can just point towards... Okay, then uh, I could have left it at the top. And then what they're doing is they say node and this is where to hook into it. Uh, and that's why, because they've declared their script below, but I think this is okay. So this I don't need to do anymore. The starting state I also don't need to do anymore. And then this should just be remembered bytes. And wait, is it an execution? Yes. <laughs> that's brutal. <laughs> 
how to build a Kotlin website. Want to learn how to make an Android app? <laughs> no, no, I don't. Uh, that's sad. Uh, I'll just leave this at var, even though I really want to re make it into a const, I guess. Um, remembered bytes. And let's make sure that this is then a const because this and this thing seems like... Oi. There we go. Const... Uh... Jesus. Scrambled bytes. And then maybe an underscore, I guess. Kill. And this is the key. Maybe I should call it key. Key. Voila. And then I can reuse it over. Meow. There we go. <clears throat> Do you have a Discord server? You can make Kotlin Discord bots. <gasps> That's actually on the planning somewhere. But it might have not have been, was it? Yeah, it was a Discord bot, that's true. Uh, somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. Ah, here we go. Write a Discord bot to get a, a ping whenever somebody else challenges you. Okay, nice. Very good, very good information. Use Discord as a Kotlin bot library. Nice. Cool. That's a very good tip. I was already like wondering how the hell am I going to do that, but then, yeah. Oh, okay, nice. And then they've got the getting started. Cool. I well, definitely will. Can I copy that link? I can't, but I can't click on it. That makes no sense. Eh? <laughs> Streamlabs. Um, I will also add it here. Nice. Cool. So this is the stuff that we need to use with Alum to call that stuff. So then this stuff is going to kick yeah. in. Yeah, I, I, I do, but I don't, I just don't use it. I don't use it <laughs> so it makes no it makes no sense for me to have it it was just like a way to have it it makes it, it i don't i don't use it should have just um never <laughs> never done that that's like a next level audience interaction stuff like i would feel um, obligated to continuously check that stuff and i'm already too busy checking other stuff if you know what I mean it's I use it as a place to store links hmm but why not Miro I can use Miro for that here we go main I get suggestions that's true. Yeah, maybe I need to be less of a... Be less afraid and just do it. Oh, but all of that just takes time <laughs> always. <laughs> I don't know. I'll, I'll look into it, I promise. I will look into it. 
Um, I forget what this thing meant. It's I know it's composition, but we'll need to look into what that stuff is again. So basically, that's what they have here. And the maybe dot mop look uh, seems to work. So maybe if I do the convert bytes bit, where is that? Here. Here they seem to be using, I think I can import this, no, this one, oh jeez, base 64, where the hell, oh maybe they even have a, Okay, so now I need to go look for... Oh, wait, it's all over here. <laughs> Helpers. Mm-hmm. Should really just move this to uh, some other place, of course. Maybe something like... Encoding or something? I don't really know. Security? Because it has to do with security. It doesn't expose any any other types anyway, so... Let's move that to a different file already. And call it... <sighs> yeah, let's do security. Jesus. Sure. And then we can import bytes. Uh, maybe bytes is a type that gets defined up top. What do you like most about Kotlin? I, uh, the thing I like most about Kotlin is probably the nullable, nullable types. It's such a, um, a stupid feature but it's such an important one, you know? Like, um, <clears throat> if you just consider, so I, I'm, I'm a Java developer, and um, if you write a function, maybe I can do a quick Java thing. Uh, Maybe, uh, what was your, your example before? It was something like uh, uh, do title or something. And then you've got uh, some kind of a string. <laughs> it's difficult for me to type Java even. Final var title equals. There you go. So now we need to write a function uh, the way you do that in Java is you're, you first declare what sort of thing that's gonna come out of it. So it's a string. Oh, and it's a private function, of course. Then you write to title, which takes in a string object of uh, some string to transform into a title. And then you can say return return null. There you go. Oh yeah, okay, let's just make it static for now. There, fine. So now what happens is, uh, and then nice. So what would happen is if you do this, then Java doesn't complain. Okay, Kotlin might because it's always null. I mean, uh, IntelliJ might, but because it's always null, but you can, it's, it's still compiling. And that's the, the thing that, if you want to make sure that your do title function uh, works, maybe now it doesn't really make sense all that much. So what's it called? Hey, you want to say um, uh, here, a very simple function to lowercase. So I just want to append the string that I get in and I want to append it to this title uh, string. That's it, that's it. 
So already, even if you don't have this, this this uh, function can break. So what would happen is you're going to write a class scratch test. And then you're saying, I'm going to write a test function called uh, to title should not be called with null. And then you write a unit test for that. And you're saying, if I do scratch dot do title with null, then you want to assert that uh, thrown by or something. I forget what the actual syntax is. Uh, oh no, wait, it's something like this. Exception of type uh, illegal argument exception dot class is thrown by and then some function that calls this. All right, now here's our unit test. Why not? Yeah, the, the autocomplete is not going to work because I haven't loaded in um, a search a in my scratch files for Java. That's why. So this is not going to work, but it's just as, as an example. So you would write a unit test to verify that this function here should not accept null arguments. And I really, if you just consider this, it's, it's so silly and people or Java developers, what they typically do is they will just assume that there's always something that's been passed along there so that it's safe to call dot lowercase on it and because if you call null like uh, like we would do here then you would get a null pointer exception and uh your your application would break it would explode quite quite heavily and that's something you want to catch early so what you need to do to circumvent this in java and not write a unit test for that is you would need to wrap this in a type like um, um, my important book title, or maybe it's just a book title that we want to book name. Here we go. And now you write a wrapper class for this and your wrapper class is going to look like this. It will just wrap a string uh, name. You'll need to have a constructor for that. Uh, voila. And you only, I don't think you will need a getter, but uh, whatever. And now what you need to do is you need to make sure that if name equals null, then you throw a legal argument exception. And you write this test this one single time saying name uh, of a book should never be null, whatever. So once you have this and you use book name everywhere, then you can really know, well, I'm getting in a book name. It can only be constructed this way. And the constructor says that it should never be null, the name. And in that case, you can just really count on the fact that this thing is not null. That's how you circumvent it in, in Java. But in Kotlin, the only thing you need to do is just type your function like this and then it will never be null <laughs> because your compiler will fail if you pass null to this function then it's going to complain hey i'm not expecting null here i really want something and this has already solved all of this code imagine just imagine and this is such a simple problem that you have in java and it just takes a bunch of silly, stupid time that you don't want to spend when you're writing applications. And you can be very explicit with it. So this is my, the, my most favorite Kotlin feature ever. And if you've noticed this stuff here, the final var stuff, this is basically uh, the equivalent of val title. Uh,
of this in uh, in Kotlin. That's the same thing. So final var is an immutable um, local variable, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And before, uh, so this is still Java. You can still write that normally or before in the olden days you needed to write it like this and then you didn't get the, the type inference from the function calling uh, afterwards so you would need to write your your code like that and then if you had um integer uh, isbn or whatever it would look all wonky and now you can make it look like a little bit more readable like when you're declaring some variables you could do it like that var is used if you don't want to specify the type that's correct yeah in java eh? in java uh but so and java is uh how do you say that like it's migrating towards um using more kotlin features because um like data classes because for this the the stuff i didn't write you should still also write because book name is um a value object is what we call that where you have to implement uh an equals and a hash code for that and then typically also a getter get name but no setter because you only want to construct it one way. And then the other thing you, you also want is you want this to be a construct, a static factory method, something like that. Huh? This, I don't know why. Mm. Okay, so the refactoring doesn't work, but uh, it should become private. And then you'd have a public static book name called book name, which takes in a string name, string name, which should return a new book name using that name. There we go. So in that case, this, all of this stuff, this entire lines 13 to 45, this is the equivalent of saying in Kotlin, Uh, that's it <laughs> a single working line that's it that's how you do that in Kotlin <laughs> just think about that think about that for a minute Yeah, and then this is what they've got now as a data records or, or like a record. So you can type this in Java now using this, this syntax. And then uh, I, I think it's like that final string. I think that's what you would type in Java now. I'm not really sure. Yeah, oh my God. It, uh, yeah. It feels good talking to someone that also loves Scotland. <laughs> it really does. You know, but so every time I now write Java codes, I'm always thinking like, why, why, why Java? I really don't like it anymore. You should uh, go on the, the Kotlin Slack if you're not on there yet. Got a lot of like-minded people there. Let's get rid of this filthy Java. Buh, buh, bah. I'm looking for the type bytes. I can't find it. Ah. Here we go. Huh? What do you mean they don't let you in? They 
I haven't sent you the email thing. That's so weird. Is the, the email inviter broken maybe? Can I maybe, can I invite you? Oh yeah, I, I always forget that Slack is also very uh, <laughs> resource in intensive. Uh... I wonder why, why is the import not working? It's like uh, my application doesn't know yet about Elm Bytes, but here it is. Oh, it's indirect for some reason. Hmm, I do need it in a direct. Damn. <clears throat> I'm also not sure if I can just go like this okay they've rebuilt here Scanning files and now I should be able to do this. No. Ah, oh, voila. There we fixed it. Oh, and uh, I don't know where that thing comes from. Maybe I should also follow a bit where the base 64 is coming from. Okay, so it's end code. Oh, Jesus. Is it still... Um, gave me some suggestion, huh? Okay, so that means that I also need the bytes. This one, I think. I'm not really sure. Or maybe this one. Let's, che let's check if this works. And it might be the other one anyway. <clears throat> there we go. Let's see if this works. Yeah, I need to uh, refresh. Voila. Okay, nice. Uh, and then what? This I now need to import. Okay, now init is no longer the init that we expect. Ah. That's why that was a bit weird. Here's the maybe string, which was state, and we were just disregarding it. So, mm. and here their init function looks like. Maybe I should also add this to the subscriptions then, but 
No. That's gonna take me down another path. Let's first make the init function work. Where are you at? Okay, this thing. And the URL stuff we've got already. So it's not just a maybe string, but the maybe having state and then a string. And then what? Here they called it M flags. Sure. M flags is used how? Oof. Ah, oh my god. Okay, so what they're doing here. Uh, maybe just read the documentation. <laughs> During the authentication flow, we'll run twice into the init function. The first time for the application, the, uh, when you're visiting in the anonymous, as an anonymous user, basically. And we proceed with the idle state, waiting for the user, aka you, to request a sign in. And the second time, that's on the redirect to the authorization server, yes. And then that, the ID, so that's the IDP. They redirect us back to our application with an access token. That's the JWT, the JWT thing, and other fields as query parameters. When query parameters are present and valid, we consider user authorized. Okie doke. And um, shouldn't they do some kind of other routing then? I guess it's, that's here because <clears throat> uh, on my initial, um, how do you say, like when you initially get to the, the app basically, then um, you're always presented with the home message, even if you're... Uh, Okay, I forgot where it was hosted, so it wasn't 3,000, but 8,000. Ah, yeah, now it's not compiling anymore. Dang it. So I was just gonna say, even if you put flurbadigerp here, you will still end up on the home page because I don't do anything with uh, your URL here. <coughs> Oh wait, that's a lie. I do parse the URL, but I always fetch the leaderboard. That's that's it. Yeah. That actually can be uh, got rid of by just doing CMD none or something. But now, so instead of just doing the empty model with a parse URL, I now need to take into account that when a user is, was redirected on successful login with their, or at their IDP, then um, some stuff is gonna be in the path and I need to make sure that they are logged in properly. And that's what they're saying here. <clears throat> um, if it got, if you got the correct query parameters and like a valid JWT token, then you can be redirected or something. <laughs> I would probably quit at this point and start using Kotlin. Yeah, no worries. I feel like I uh, I know quite an okay amount of Elm to understand stuff, but uh, in this case, it's not the language that's making it difficult. I think it's the uh, like conceptually the stuff that makes it difficult. So here, uh, I think what they are doing is <clears throat> if you're successfully authenticated, then they want to show you like your actual, the actual page. Yeah, that's okay. This is, um, I think what might help is this is an, this is the description. So uh, this, this is, this is, this is just what Elm looks like. You're first saying in it. Uh, th this is what init looks like and init is a function and it takes in a maybe type maybe you've uh, this is like an optional an op like a 
a better way of doing optional. An optional that has a, a record type that has a state uh, field. Then it also takes in a URL and then a key and it produces a tuple. That's what those braces are of uh, a model type and a command that's typed with the message type. So this is all uh, type information. Uh, it's not, no, it's not like any. Um, uh, or maybe it is in fact. Yeah, it is, but then um, this would then be the, the string. So this you can replace this with a question mark basically in Kotlin. So if you, uh, let's say we've got an object in Kotlin, a data class that has a state field, then, and we called it uh, OAuth state or something like that, then you can read it in Kotlin as init colon OAuth question mark, URL key, blah, blah, blah. Yes, yeah. but you have to unpack it in, uh, in Elm because it's a functional programming language. Yeah, so the the arrows are a way of... Um, <laughs> it's just a way I can I can cheat my way around this. It's just the way you define uh, parameters. So everything before the last arrow, these are all arguments to the function and then this is the output type that's the the cheating explanation but really what's happening here is currying or partial application so you're saying init is a function that takes in a maybe and outputs a url and this can be the input that then outputs a key and then this can be the input that then outputs this last thing that's like the more difficult explanation maybe you know currying from a javascript or partial application where you can just keep on adding new stuff and by uh, you typically use it when using a, a builder for example like you're building uh, some arguments yeah javascript is you yeah wait and, and why why do you find it to be you I have a very specific opinion about that. And it's at the same time, it's the same reason for why I love Elm. Um, different form of as that I don't think. So it's not casting and or anything. It's uh, how it, can I show that in an easy way? Mm. I don't know that as notation in fact Or that keyword, let's say, I don't know. If you mean as from Kotlin, as is only doing uh, casting, basically. So it's just saying, yeah, 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 I know uh, this stuff is going to be a URL, but that's not really what's happening. Where is that init function of mine again? Uh, here we go. So I, I could declare a new... Uh, um, function that takes in a maybe takes in a string <clears throat> and then outputs a URL and uh, do something like s and then this returns I don't know something some URL oh, I don't know um, and then you could do init 3 saying I can take in a maybe with a state 
string and the URL and then takes in a key and then in it for we basically have that's this one so if you have all of these uh, init functions or in the declarations you would be able to say um, first let's just call init2 with a maybe oops with a maybe state equals derp and then you would be able to say call init3 with this as a an argument and then you would be able to say call init with this as your argument but instead of um, calling it like this uh, you could also write it as uh, yeah basically just this uh, it's very very difficult to explain uh, using uh, these kind of uh, functions What happens if you use maybe? Ah, yeah. So there are no optional. Uh, there's no question marks basically. So what's? Uh, let's see. Yeah. If we just type this as a some some kind of a model, eh? type alias um, state model or record. Here we go. State record. It looks like that. And then we can say it's a maybe of a state record. Voila. So really, um, if I were to translate this thing into Kotlin, it will look like this a bit, I think. So we've got a function, we call it init, and we're getting a st uh, state record, which is a state record question mark, a URL, mm. a key. And we're returning a, I think it's a pair in Kotlin eh? of a model and a, yeah, this I can't really. So this is what it would look like. If that makes sense. So this is how you would write that in Kotlin, I think. Oh, this is Elm. So this is not Kotlin. Eh? Please be careful. This is this is Elm. Eh? Hey, we're we're writing Elm code right now. This is not Kotlin at all. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No wonder you weren't able to follow. Yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, that's okay. Yeah, I mean, I understand where the confusion is coming from, like where, why the arrows? <laughs> and then you hear me explain stuff about partial application. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, um, yeah, no problem. There we go. So let's keep it like that and it looks almost the same as uh, over here. And then we can totally copy paste this stuff. Uh, so this is what was there before. Maybe I'm going to keep it <clears throat> as like a go-to so that I can still find my way <laughs> after, after. Whoa, look at all this stuff. Oh, I need to unpack about a, a, a bit about this because and where's origin coming from all of a sudden oh okay that's the URL basically so we should call this URL there you go this 
this we know. No. Navigation key is I think what they use there. So yeah, indeed. So this should be just key. Uh, Oi, import. This origin stuff should still be URL. It's not doing anything. Eh? Did I already? Ah, it's called nav. Hmm. So if I do nav dot replace URL and then I guess expose this one. This seems to be working, but I'm not sure how much. Yeah, see, looks looks like it's working. It does remind of Gotland a bit, but it's um, um, I say uh, it's even more more strict towards types. I would say. So if you, not sure if I can uh, show it here. Uh, maybe. In the, so in the home page we're showing a leaderboard um, and this leaderboard response wait this leaderboard response is being filled with this result here um, by handling the response so when you do a call something comes back and that's Jason and that JSON you typically want to turn into some kind of a type eh? and in JavaScript it's super easy because you can just do uh, what's it called like JSON dot parse or something I think in JavaScript and then easy you already have a JavaScript object um, but then in Kotlin you really need to say it should look like this where is that decoder stuff again? Mm, here we go. So here we are saying... Uh, can I even find that properly? So some stuff is gonna uh, be entered and then we're going to have to decode that into different objects basically. And the leaderboard consists out of a list of applying these decoders, which are leaderboard entries and a leaderboard entry you can decode by checking the rank field and it might be there or it might be not there. But if it is there, then it's you should decode it as an integer and then their nickname, which is always going to be there and it's going to be a string. This is how, it, how you need to really, really, really make explicit like what type it is, otherwise it just won't work. And you create your leaderboard entry using this kind of decoding logic. It's quite difficult. Uh... <laughs> so there's not a bunch of um, maybe uh, typically a Kotlin developer is used to a lot of um, developer friendliness. I, I want to say, but in Elm, the developer friendliness lies in the fact that uh, once it compiles it works it will work so you need to uh, lean on the compiler from uh, Michael Feathers working with legacy codebook pattern to learn what stuff is gonna work yes yeah, so th this is atypical web dev i want to say <laughs> this is more typical towards using functional languages so if you're gonna make a generic statement you're gonna want to stay away from functional programming languages or strict typed languages i should say but they come with a, a huge advantage maybe uh, one day you will learn and you will be able to make a more uh, 
balanced decision or something. Gator is quite okay, yeah. Gator is quite okay. It's it's not uh, that that difficult. Um. Okay, now I'm wondering why this is com not compiling. I guess it doesn't really make sense because we don't have an idle type. Yeah, I mean, okay to, to learn about. It's not uh, that difficult. It's not like uh, learning coroutines, for example. Coroutines is quite difficult, I want to say. Wait. I think now I just remember that the uh, cater is full of coroutines, so <laughs> it might be difficult, though. Spring Boot is quite okay. <laughs> uh... Let's see. Here's what Spring Boot looks like. I remember if you want to register, register, sorry. The only thing you need to do is define a class. You put some magical spring annotations on it. Uh, this is a dependency injection, which, which you can just ignore. Then you define some function that you want to um, handle a post request to slash api slash register you're saying i want some object that is json and i accept it you just mark it as a request body jackson jackson which is the the library that takes care of uh, parsing your string into an actual object so you don't need to worry about that either just just declare those as a uh, data classes like I did here, and then uh, that's it. And then uh, you can start working with it basically. And that's uh, your Spring Boot controller. And I believe I'm not sure anymore which. Oh, I think it's the registration one that I did in Cator as well. So in Cator you need to. <clears throat> It's more declarative style, I would say, because it's just a function where you're declaring rich routes you want to do something at. And this route API slash register can be posted to. And then you do uh, the same thing here. So here to get the, uh, the JSON body that's been posted towards this uh, endpoint, you do call.receive using uh, reify types. You get the registration info in there and you do the same thing basically. That's it. So in code sense, this looks way more simple, I think, than your Spring Boot controller because it's full of uh, annotations that you need to understand, I guess. Here it's more uh, normal code, I want to say. So that makes it a bit more easy to understand and work with. But unit testing I haven't done yet with Kate or a buddy of mine or a colleague of mine has already done that. And uh, you can write really nice expressive uh, code with that as well. So yeah, I can recommend. Using Spring Boot as a dashboard for your bot. Hmm. So the way I perceive Spring Boot is... Um, <clears throat> I mean, you can do that, of course. Uh, with Gator, you can do the same. It's just an embedded web server, right? Into networking stuff. That I don't... I know so little about it. Shameful, really. So good on you. Um, so I'm going to extend my model 
with a flow and a redirect URI. Where is that one? What type is this actually? Ah, it says it is a URL. Okay, nice. So if we go to, hmm, maybe I can go like this. Yeah. So our model uh, type alias should now get a flow, and maybe I'm going to call this auth flow. Um, which is going to be an auth flow type and it should get a redirect URI which is going to be a URL and then type auth flow should look like idle I think and then the other ones I don't remember uh, This is uh, indeed what IntelliJ Ultimate looks like. I've had some problems actually with, uh, I mean, in, in collaborating with somebody that didn't have IntelliJ Ultimate. And I was saying like, well, why is it not working on your machine? It is working on mine. Um, but they had their the community edition. And there were some issues where, especially with regards to Spring Boot, um, the class path is calculated much differently. I wish I could buy it. I'm one of the lucky few, uh, well, not the lucky few, like everyone at the company that I work for, they all have uh, IntelliJ licenses and they can use it to, for their own, uh, I say like for, for, your, for your own coding purposes, let's say. And now I think it's only fair that I share a link to the company that I work for. <laughs> it's just to visit the website and then, yeah. Thank you, Kunlabora. I love you guys. Uh, flow, we had something there, flow. There you go. Okay. And now, hmm. I feel like this can also be part of that security stuff. This type. Because really, this is just routing stuff. And then I don't understand yet why we need to redirect your URI as a state in our model. <clears throat> but I guess we do. Um, this we need to import. Yeah. User info doesn't exist yet, I don't think. And then user info. Oh, picture, maybe I don't need that. And I think I will put that somewhere below here. Or maybe just above it, yeah, it'll, it'll be even better. Model full application state of our app. And then here's like the, uh, the stuff needed or OIDC flow. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the one I think, or I hope. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Less stuff is not compiling. Uh, ah, yeah, <laughs> dang it. Uh, so empty model is a way to create an empty model, but I'm going to have to refactor that anyway, because where it used to get created, where is it here in my init function? So it's going to look completely different anyway. 
Um, but that's cool. That's cool. That's cool. What we can do? What can we do next? Not a function, but it was given one. Ah, here's some other stuff that's not working. What the heck? Artificial delay. Oh, wait. In practice, the access token could be requested right here. Uh, so maybe we don't need this. Bye. Or, ah, no, now I need to, damn, that's, this sucks. So I need to make sure that, um, I would call like the actual, um, what's it called? Maybe just do this. That should work normally, I think. Uh, oops. Then I need to revert a bit. <clears throat> Voila. And this was the stuff that was there before, so maybe we can just get rid of that. Oh no. Oh no. Um, maybe I don't want to do this. Do I? In any case, we've copied that up top, like the original thing, so we, I need to... Um, so this is the empty model function, which takes in a URL or something, a route and the key. Um, and that will create a model. But what they're doing here is that they're actually based on whatever they did with the parse token of that URL that's being uh, uh, extracted here. So if it's empty, the flow should be idle and you pass along the redirect URI or something and then you do none. So really what we're doing here is I want to append this bit. Oh, dang. And yeah. Uh, uh, two. So I want to do uh, that. And then hopefully um, empty model. Takes two things and then tries to create a model with that. Um, but now we've extended our model in fact with auth flow and redirect URI. So really what I can do is uh, just say idle and then redirect URI and this should compile I think um. ah yeah dang yeah, it's not a model that's gonna come out of this effect. That's why it's not compiling yet. Um, so this is like a, only a partial model that we're doing here. Maybe I just don't need to use this right now then, the empty model part. <clears throat> We can refactor that later. So that would mean use this and then a route would be the parse URL stuff. 
then there's a key and then there's idle and redirect URI. And now we have like an actual model there. So here, what we've done is we're, we're using um, the mm, record types construct as a constructor function to construct a model. Um, so now we can extract it a bit, I guess. Uh, and before all of this jazz was the route. So really what I can do yeah. So what are the parts that I don't care about? It's this part, huh? That's like the empty part of my model. And I guess the key I also don't really care about. No, wait, I do care about it. It's, it's very important, in fact, that it's this this key. <laughs> Otherwise, it stops. It just stops working. Mm, so maybe I can write empty model as a, I'm going to get a URL, a key, and then an auth flow. And then I guess a redirect URI. I'm not really sure. It seems to be past always but I don't really know why but that I can worry about later okay so redirect URI uh, and then I can say well create a model with this and this and then do parse URL with URL and build a key yeah basically all of this stuff let's call it 2 and then this should read as empty model 2 and that no longer should take that on that part this I um, I only need to pass the URL to that thing. It will take a key, then an auth flow thing, and then a redirect URI. Okay, nice. That's already a lot more concise. Um, again, I'm not sure if I need to do this or not. Because uh, I think it'll it should get triggered um, in home. So when home gets rendered, it should, this thing should be triggered. <laughs> but I'm not sure. We'll notice soon enough, enough if, uh, if it starts compiling and um, I go to the home page and it doesn't render my leaderboard anymore, then we'll know what's up. <laughs> <laughs> so so there we go uh, and then what so if the library was able to parse the token uh, then we'll get a token and state and state I'm not sure what that thing is in fact it's maybe string I think that's the uh, where's index and this one that might oh wait uh, it's this one flags I think <clears throat> because in our initial init function you get this the, the state uh, thing so hopefully that's just that uh, everywhere where there's this going on now I need to really what I need to do is do empty model 2 using URL key and then this and redirect URI and now since this is one thing I need to put it into braces braces around it and it should work noise here it's the same thing 
So really what we're doing is just making it compiler. Uh, here we need uh, authorized token as a flow value. Voila. And then the batch stuff we need to figure out later. And then another error here. So we'll do empty model with this stuff. And then it says errored. And an error authorization gets piped into that one. Okay. Almost compiling. This we're not using anymore, I think. Oh yeah, wait, you can see it here, so it's not being used. So get rid of that stuff. And then this is breaking and why is that? Oh, we need to, oh, maybe it's the subscriptions thing. Not really sure. Uh, all the way at the top, they declare their main as a program. Oh, so these are integers. This might be why. Um, maybe of a list of integers. Voila. <gasps> So hopefully, since it's compiling, I'm guessing it should still just simply work. Otherwise, we'll need this. Okay. I still wonder. Uh, oh, I, I do think I'm going to need to. Uh, Hmm. What was I gonna say? The index part was changed, so I'm going to need to just restart um, my Elm Live thing. Hmm, that doesn't seem like. It's working, eh? So here we're having to deal... Uh, cannot access scrambled bytes key before initialization at remembered bytes. Uh, then I'm gonna guess that in this function of remembered bytes, this one, we're trying to get scrambled bytes and then it explodes. Uh, what was there before? You could still just get stuff apparently, but then... Um, stuff was JSONified, let's say, or it would be null. And now we're saying uh, so if you have bytes and parse it to an integer uh, to a decimal I think yeah. and otherwise it's null okay and then my error message is saying cannot access scrambled bytes key before initialization. Why is that? So I expected uh, application session storage. Hmm. You know, nothing's in there, of course. 
That makes sense. Because it was the first time, huh? Oh wait, it's local storage. My bad. But again, it's just empty. Um, and what's this thing? Ah, hang on. Um, so we do need to set this as a, in in uh, our port. Um, and that we haven't set up yet. So um, where is that part? Uh, this is fine, but then in our subscription, yeah, that's this thing here. Um, subscriptions in our main.elm file. In the application, here are subscriptions. Here we're going to put um, this. that I don't really remember where the always is coming from don't like it when they don't make explicit imports but I under understand it is Scotland just Python C Java it just might actually yeah yeah it, i pythonic ah yeah okay i was just thinking maybe you're referring to the fact that it compiles to java i don't know if kotlin is um i wouldn't compare kotlin to python because python as far as i know is uh that has a, a or its strength is dynamic types Whereas Scotland is uh, stronger typing, that's the stuff I like. Why? Why though? Why is this not working? Also, why is my subscriptions thing so far removed from? <laughs> yeah, Java static indeed. Ah, okay, nice. Create a function that always returns the same value. All right. So I always want the random bytes called random bytes thing, apparently. Oh, and then I'll need got random bytes as my message type as well. So this is gonna be new. Kotlin is like the Python version of Java. Ah, okay. That might very well be true. Oh shit, what's this? Random bytes. We forgot that. Oh, and then also, of course, we'll need to take in a list of integers as the wrapped type for the get random bytes thing. Hang on, eh? Oh, we didn't specify these at all. <laughs> I mean... What? It does return a sub. Oh, maybe. No, this should work. Ah, maybe it's because of this. Uh... Hmm. I'm not sure if that was a good thing to do. So really what's it what it's saying is that <clears throat> maybe the type is different here from the subscriptions part.
Okay, we're back at the init. No, uh, I want the main program again. Here. A random byte. So that's the call to that port. That should initialize this got random bytes thing with. Ah, uh, yeah, and then that's why it need to be a uh, any message. But really, no, it should be uh, this this one. So that's good. But then I don't understand. <clears throat> If it just returns that, why can't it just not be this? Oh yeah, okay. I was, I was, that was mind boggling. <laughs> That's why I guess they use the always is just to have, to not have to deal with model or something. Okay. Okay, so now what we're saying is whenever your application starts, um, you want to subscribe to this random bytes function, which is something that gets called outside of uh, Elm, which is this thing, which is in fact this thing. Where is it? Random bytes, um, which gets sent random bytes. <laughs> And this is a way to call that. Um, where are we at then? Um, and then your application's update function is going to get triggered saying got random bytes was uh, fired, but there's no case. Uh, this So this is also much like Kotlin where you're saying uh, your case expression isn't exhaustive enough so you need to take care of what happens or what should happen when you're you're getting random bytes what what should your model model look like and then we're going to cheat and look what the thing looks like in our update function where you at got random bytes oh but they do See, this is a bit unfortunate, in fact. So here they declare that your got random bytes is only important when you're in the idle state, apparently. Uh, so we could do that as well, but then I'd have to change that for everything here. Um, so maybe that's it's still okay to do that in fact. So and it's not flow but auth flow. Um, and then all of the previous ones that we had before, let's check if we can do multi-cursor here. I think we can. Noise. So these were the message types that were there before, and then we can just check idle and those things uh, or maybe we can even say we don't fucking care mate um, and then we can say but I do care when it's involving random bytes and in this scenario so when you've got your model as a flow of idle and your random bytes were fired at that point. Oh, I'm a bit, a bit silly in it. I know, but because I do want to take care of all of the other things. So here I want to do got random bytes with the complete model. Got random bytes doesn't exist yet, so let's Go and look for that one. Is it up here? No, it's meow. And here they do the navigation or the redirect. Uh, it's 
I'll put it somewhere here, I guess. I don't know. And here it's a bit interesting because <clears throat> all of a sudden they're using configuration. But where do they get that from? Where is this thing used? Uh, this might just be config... Um, uh, allez. Static setup somewhere. Here's the type, but maybe they've declared it somewhere else before. Yeah. Also quite annoying. So here we've got um, our auth zero uh, stuff. So really, this needs to be filled in dynamically at some point. Huh? Um, I guess it's fine if we also do this. Uh, and this we can change into the Google OIDC stuff if you wanted to. This is apparently also a type. Let's check out what that thing looks like. Ah, it is a URL. Oh, that's cool. Didn't know you could do that. Authorization. This I don't understand. The default HTTPS URL. Where is that? Somewhere default. Oh, this is a helper. Ah. Oh, I see. To just get the. I. Okay. Oh, that's also added somewhere. Maybe in security. Huh? We've already added some stuff there. Voila. And then we need to import. Uh, oh, we already had the other one. Okay, I definitely want the first one gone. Voila. This we need to import. There we go. And then what next? Next stuff. This should be auth flow. Here we are updating our model and we're saying only update auth flow to idle basically. Um, and then this is a command. which is this object here that's being piped to OAuth make authorization URL which eventually gets piped into navigation.load so that would be nav.load because we already imported that way and this is a command yeah okay nice Still compiling, looks good. Maybe it will work now because we've taken care of the random bytes ports. Let's see if that's indeed the case. Ah yeah, we need this to be a port module now that we're using ports. So port module main. Yeah.
This I also don't understand. Why is that? Random bites. For declaration. Here it's saying that... Oh, maybe it's the specific type. It's too specific. So this is the stuff that you learn uh, when you do Elm a lot, I think. Like you, it needs to be generic for some reasons, and for some reasons it needs to be not generic, but more strictly typed. Um, here we've got the subscriptions, random bytes. So let's do lowercase m. Um, and same here. Then I guess this should also be lowercase m. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's strange. Ah, yeah, of course. So <laughs> that's quite silly. That I that I don't understand why IntelliJ is not complaining about it. Honestly, let's go to the update function. Because I I so if you do underscore, then um, what you're basically saying I don't care about the first argument in this pattern matching thing. So I don't care about the auth flow. But I do care about the message type. So for all of these, we don't care about the auth flow as long as the registration message is this thing. Um, but then here, all of a sudden, I'm saying, well, for god random bytes, if you've got that kind of message, then I suddenly do care about the auth flow. So for now, I think we can just do this and then get away with it. We did get away with it, but it's still not working. With the same error, in fact. Damn it. Mm, so the other thing that sometimes helps if is just reloading Elm just like this. Mm. <clears throat> Yeah, except this time also no dice. So ports is also a, n a new thing for me. Um, uncaught a reference error cannot access before initialization. So I'm just wondering if this is a, just a pure JavaScript error or what? I mean, it makes sense that it's that you can't access this. Is my JavaScript just off maybe? It's always the case. The only thing I did was uh, replace it with a constant. That can't be it, right? Please don't tell me that this is it. See, now I need to really restart it because um, Elm Live doesn't pick up the index HTML or I haven't told it to look at that fact. Oh my god, that's it? Okay, please explain why this wouldn't work. I cannot comprehend. Why why does this work? <sighs> so if I use Hmm. 
Is this um, hoisting maybe? So, once again, if I put it back, then it's gonna break. That's what we're saying, right? Let's find out. to understand this error message better than which initialization is this thing talking about then is it because it, it's not a global is it Anyway, this is gonna fix it. Oh, maybe I can look at what it was before. Yeah, it was never fetched again here, so I guess that's okay. Yeah. Okay, whatever. There I fixed it, Jesus Christ. Of course, it's the JavaScript that killed me. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't bash shouldn't bash all right so if uh, any in any case that stuff works but I need to restart it so this is good uh, and it's not doing redirects yet which is fine. Um, now I need to figure out, oops, why or how it's doing the redirects, Dana. Uh, I think this is this week covered this week covered this is covered as well um that's fine the configuration we also copied i think yeah i think this is how you decode uh stuff from there the client id is fixed here i guess we need to uh Make sure that's correct as well. I guess we could even just use their setup because they've um, they've got their client ID fixed in here. <clears throat> um, here's the init function that we've I think completely taken over this part. But then what? This one we do have, and then we don't have a way to get the access token. Actually, the next part we should do is the actual reader right now. Ah, uh, sign in requested. That's, I guess, the point in time when they they log in. So maybe this should we should fire when a user clicks register. Sign in requested. We'll do gen random bytes 16. Then got random bytes will be triggered again. 
because it's a port. Uh, this one we've got as well, I think. Yeah. Here's the authorization URL, and then this thing should happen. The load, and that's what the thing that actually does the the call to um, the IDP. <clears throat> so we've got a function called got random bytes, which gets triggered when got random bytes was was sent. And I thought that um, this was gonna get executed upon the init function because here. Well, because of the the way the init function takes in the the initial flag, but that's incorrect then, because they trigger gen random bytes when sign in is requested. I guess idle then means authentication flow started or something. Let's see what they initialize their model with. Yeah, with I no not not really idle. No, if it's empty then it is indeed idle, yeah. So they initialize with idle, which is a bit now this flow type is used for to, to indicate two states really. Uh, one is you're unauthenticated and two is you're loading the authentication really even though it's like a very short uh it's only fractions of a second really sign in request it is something that we want to trigger <clears throat> when uh, a user clicks register uh, and that we do over here so register button clicked. Mm, that's a message type here. And then we just do register player with a model. So instead of just doing all of this stuff, um, that's incorrect. This is when you're already at the registration screen. You've typed in your name and then you click on register. So that's not where we want to be. We want to be in home. Home has. Hmm. I forgot to check. In fact, ah, we don't have our, our leaderboard fetched. Let's buy it. Okay. It's quite bad. But that we can fix by a oh it's also not a great idea that should work better um yeah in the init um we were always just setting up our model and then with the command that's the dot none. So here's the none, and then there's the clear URL. Which I don't know. Oh, okay. Um. Hmm. Fetch leader board. Which should be this. And then we can combine those with batch, apparently. So we'll do clear URL and then also fetch leaderboard. And here we do the same. Same. And 
and last but not least, same. Uh, maybe here we don't need uh, we just do fetch leaderboard. Okay. And now our, our leaderboard should always be fetched regardless of whether you're it's empty success i guess error it's still okay to uh fetch the leaderboard i guess i also don't know what we're gonna do with the authorization error maybe just show it on screen somewhere somehow uh, but if we refresh <clears throat> Aha, we've got our Carbera tutorials back again. Nice. Okay, now this uh, old init function can really get lost because that's just working now. This will just rename to. This we will just rename to. Thank you, well. Empty model. Um, and then. I was, I had something in my copy buffer, but I completely forgot about it. Ooh, we've got a longer copy buffer. No, I definitely just copied it from uh, over here somewhere. Um, yeah, wait, I've, I've, I remember now. It was the sign in sign in requested thing let's just paste it here and then auth flow here we go now we've got it in our intellij copy buffer but i guess it could be there uh... this we need to trigger whenever uh, home register button is clicked. Registration redirect button. Ah, here we go. Uh, clicked. So whenever this is clicked, it's here over here. We do nav.push URL so we immediately say just navigate to the registration page and instead of doing this i guess what i want to do next is um redirect uh, um so this is actually uh navigate to registration that's really what's what was happening there before so navigate to registration looks like this hmm. and it's going to take a model I guess there we go so now instead of just navigating to registration I want to say sign in requested instead. Oh yeah, but now. Mm. So this model is, it's not the same model, let's say. So here we, in, uh, we're we in the home.alum file. Here our model is only looks like this. We've got a leaderboard, an API failure and a nav key. Um, because it's the only thing that's uh, regarding the the home page in fact should we have done all of this in the home page is what I've been asking now I don't think so I need a way to globally oh no I need global state. So that means that um, all of my uh, sub page models sh 
should extend like a, a global state model, let's say, that will then contain um, auth flow maybe, or just a job token or a registered user maybe. <clears throat> um, but to handle this part, maybe I can just again intercept it in, uh, in, in main somewhere. Hmm, let's think about that. Okay, so this does not belong there. That means I can just revert this as well. Uh, might as well. This exists there, but then if I navigate to my update function, Mm. Here, what I really want to say is if it's any other kind of a home message aside from the registration redirect button clicked. Uh, updates. How do you do that? Something like this. Sad to say I have to go now. Great stream. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good night, friend. And good luck with Scotland. Oh, damn. I should have stopped 20 minutes ago, in fact. <laughs> uh, thanks for the warning. Does that work? Maybe it can, should be like this. Home. Dots. Oh, that seems to work, in fact. Oh, -ho. in that case, I want to call sign in requested with a model. <laughs> if you ever make a discord, let me know. Okay. I might as well use it. Uh, yeah. I'll need to set it up properly so that uh, people can find it more easily. I can't promise anything, but uh, I'll try to set it up by next stream. See ya, mate. Bye. Hey, what the hell? Get it. So it's it's the more specific kind of home message. So if it's this kind of a home message, then do that. Yeah, okay, nice. Then we'll do sign and request it, and we should redirect. So I think this should already work. Let's see if that 
is indeed true. Okay, let's click on this thing. Oh, oh it's working. Okay, the redirect is working. That's nice. And then Elm OAuth 2 is known to OAuth uh, to yeah to Auth0 because this nice person uh, Truku they've already set it up to test it their themselves. So that's why that uh, URL is indeed working. Yeah, that's so that's already nice, huh? Maybe I should set up uh, an auth zero app then. Hmm. But I only want to offer federated login, I guess. Anywho. The redirect seems to work, so that's cool. Maybe I should call it a night now or something. I don't know. What's left? The redirect. Eh? So what happens if Auth0, the authentication works, then we'll end up in this success state. And we will get an authorized token, yes. And then we will request the user info. But now... Uh, yeah, we, we already can access our token at that point. So that should be already Gucci. But then what are all those other functions for? Called access token. When does this... Throne, never. Huh? Oh, this might be. Nope, I don't get it. The access token could be requested right here. That I don't understand. What's this token then? Missing some stuff because they've. So the way I interpreted this was if you. Okay, if you have a flag. So basically, uh, we're doing a first pattern match on the token of the original URL. So once you get the URL. We'll try to do parse token. Maybe I should just look at what parse token actually does. But then um, <clears throat> uh, maybe the, this token is like the the auth code or something, like the first step of OIDC. Might be, yeah, I'm not really sure. But maybe if I go to 
the configuration initial object somewhere what scope do they send it's open id but they don't define which kind of uh uh what's it called uh i uh so i'm six su i'm suspecting that it is indeed auth code for so like it's full oauth2 flow even though it says implicit here though Dang, no, I, I don't, I don't understand it now. Too stupid. That's what I am. Yeah, so I thought this, this token was already going to be, uh, if you're in success and you check your legs and then when state is blah then else you'll just assign flow with this token yeah so first you'll check did parse token end up with a success so in that case you will get a jolt token that's what i was thinking but i might be incorrect here so if you do have your jolt token in that case, you can just set it, set it to your flow because you immediately have it already. Uh, then this got access token is gone because you you just get it the moment you initialize your app again. Um, or you get basic, you get redirected towards your app from starting from your IDP. That means you've set your token in that case and you're, you're authenticated eh? and you can start doing your calls using that token. The rest is, should be okay. Okay. I think next time we need to, uh, we need to do something with or like inspect the token that we got after successful login and then i guess set up um like an alt zero instance or whatever okay let's add that to our to do's uh yeah so patch is a thing that i can do to do both of these but that's fine ah oh, lol Splitting API calls. Don't think I'll need to do that. Um, use an OAuth2 Elm library. Takes care of redirecting and parsing tokens. I guess that's halfway done the next part is <clears throat> verify the token on successful login using auth0 or whatever IDP setup so this is what instead of auth0 I wanted to use keycloak but I can't set it up fast enough or I couldn't set it up fast enough so maybe I'll have that done by next time that way I don't need to worry about uh, viewers trying to abuse my API keys or whatever uh, because I will just be running it locally so good luck connecting to that um, yeah I think I will commit this part because it seems to run uh oh dear maybe i don't want to check in this key cloak yet that'll check in separately this i'll no, no we'll check in okay so this is mm, added i forgot the library trugu to a handle oh, to login and followed 
the implicit flow example nice then I want to commit the docker compose file uh, so added a local key cloak not working yet sad face sob hello ah, there we go and then uh, locked uh, tutorials idea from the new peacorn and we'll push all of this stuff so I guess next time we'll try to do this part it's the continuation of the jolt stuff yeah <laughs> smallest commit font ever it's yeah I think the reason why is because I'm developing in the presentation mode but when I'm doing commits then I guess IntelliJ is not uh, using the same font size for that and I'm not always developing in uh, presentation mode so I, I didn't find a way yet to uh, to fix that I'm doing great thank you so much for asking how have you been it's been a while I actually don't know how to fix that either. Okay, I wish IntelliJ had a way to distinguish fonts with their themes or something. Like that you can set font size uh, in, in, in presentation mode to blur. Oh no, poker. Barely even know her. You play online or uh, like a real life game of poker? Did you already see what where we are, where we are at? This is nice. Huh? Look at this beautiful looking website. Yeah, that's indeed, uh, of course, a nice uh, or a nicer, nicer game. Eh? I'm also missing uh, like social so contact in general, I guess. <laughs> You're laughing at my CSS skills. I didn't use any CSS for this any at all it's all the fault I can now blame it on the uh, Elm UI for that look look at this this is my CSS it's type safe CSS very much true I love it so much but yeah I mean it's the design that's uh, I'm sincerely lacking in of course Oh, I wish this is what I designed before. I just wanted it to look like this. Why can't it just look like this? Oh. Friend of mine made me uh, made me do this first. Then you will know what your your users are going to want. And I really enjoyed doing that, in fact, because it, it gave me so much ideas like, oh, maybe they don't work it. They don't want to work it like this. And these are like some constraints that we had. And I also ended up making personas out of my future users for a hobby project that might never see the light of day in production. But it, it I mean, the exercise is 
good at anything, so. There were some insights, though. <laughs> oh, anyway, I was just about to call it a night and then, uh, yeah. And I think that's exactly what I'm going to do. So maybe we'll go over the commit still. Played with CSS grid. Yeah. I've checked it out before and I, I loved it. The model makes a bit more sense to me than Flexbox, I want to say. But it's still... Eh, like... How, how do you say it? Like, I can only have one concept in my mind at the same time so if i recently learned about flexbox i'm always thinking flexbox even if you're showing me grid but i think um elm ui in fact uses the grid logic or uh, how do you say it like it's the same principle really Uh, so we were failing at using a local key clicker, setting it up. That that's that was bad. And then we extracted some stuff into security. We were doing byte conversion or something. I don't know. Uh, and then we changed our. That this is like the most important thing here. Our main module is now a port module so we can access javascript stuff being injected into our elm application at startup time that's why this has changed to a list of integers which are basically those bytes instead of just a string that gets piped into the init function or composed with i should say then our empty model function has changed a bit because we just want to have an empty model for home and registration but all of the rest we still want to just pass along then our init function has extended quite a bit because now all of a sudden we need to take into account um, whether or not we've been redirected from our IDP a clear URL command or shorthand for a command function in fact to replace the URL with uh, the redirect URI. Then the good old fetching the leaderboard. And then some stuff to deal with uh, entering the application, whether that be a successful authentication redirect from the IDP or just a fresh start. That would be this one. Um, and then yeah this we couldn't test yet but the code is already there I guess and neither could we test this here to do all of that we needed to introduce auth flow some error here uh, user info object which we're not using um, a way to deal with the sign in requested which will call a port that will then generate random bytes which we're listening to uh, down below somewhere which I should show later uh, which I should show now in fact because you're subscribing to a random bytes function that will then get triggered by JavaScript we will receive this thing which has a list of bytes where is that stuff that's over here that's the handler function for that message type which will then do um, a redirect to the IDP basically it's a very weird way to deal with all of that stuff yeah it the the thing the, so this is Elm. It's a functional language to develop type safe 
um, UIs with, which is nice, but it's also um, difficult to follow uh, be because of the syntax, it's so different than what we're usually used to look at. <laughs> um, and then we've got some hard-coded values here as well, which we need to fix. And the client ID, which we need, I guess, need to hide or something, I don't know. But it's all passing messages and that stuff we need to do in our heads. So that makes for a difficult explanation, live coding, I guess. Okay. A few more months and we'll get the semblance of living in society. Yeah. I'm hosting the, the lean coffees in Leuven and um, the next one in May is going to be, uh, well, it's not my key. Don't worry. It's a public key anyway. So <laughs> this is why I wanted to have a local key cloak uh, ID as an IDP that I don't care if I expose these keys, uh, but yeah. What was I saying? Ah, yeah, I'm organizing the lean coffees in Leuven. It's a meetup group. And um, the next one in May is gonna, we're gonna try and do a live one for the first time. And uh, since COVID happened in March last year, uh, that is if the government doesn't enforce new rules, of course, but that would be really, really awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that's the reason why I, ca I don't stream every second Tuesday of the month. So yeah, takes a while. All right, I think that's all we got. And these are like ports that gen random bytes and random bytes that point to... Uh, no point to this index HTML that has opt ports get ra gen random bytes and then the random bytes uh, subscription basically so it's the other way around I believe so in Elm we're subscribing to random bytes and this is something that we call from Elm if I'm correct Gen random bytes. Yeah. Does Sapa still work there? Um. Y yes, I think. So th this is a, a weird question to ask because now I don't know. Uh what there is <laughs> but the answer is yes he still works <laughs> there uh, he's working for um acerta Ale, indirectly no no i definitely didn't switch But he's not uh, on, on the same project that I am right now, so. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, gonna call it quitsies. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for coming to say hi. And uh, yeah, I'll send Seppa your regards without a knife in his abdomen. <laughs> Ale, see you, I think, next. Oh, Jesus, let me check because it, either it's Sunday or no, it's next Tuesday. Yeah, for sure. Do use the horse's head, okay? Will do. All right. See you around. Bye. Peace.